Hello. Uh, apologies for this hat, but I, I, can't I was wearing it earlier. I can't take it off because I have terrible hat hair. Okay. Um, what you're about to watch is my session at Processing Community Day, which was a day that happened past fall in Boston. Uh, I'm posting a ver uh, the video of my session on the Coding Train uh, YouTube channel, mostly so that people see it and know to go to the Processing Foundation YouTube channel where all of the talks and presentations from all the different fellows and different artists are all there available for you to watch. So I will include a link to the Processing Foundation's YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe to the Processing Foundation, watch all these other videos. You can actually just stop this video right now and head over there to watch them all there. But if you want, you can keep watching and my Coding Train uh, session from the Processing Day will be happening next. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Taeyun. Uh, thank you, Taeyun, for having this weird idea <laughs> to try this. I, I, I want to first say that I have no plan, <laughs> which was to, to keep it on. I, I, at one point, I sort of thought, oh, should I make some slides and like have some sort of like presentation? And then I realized it wouldn't be authentic. And plus, I, you know, <laughs> it was easier for me to just relax on the train and not try to make up too much of a plan. But I'm going to attempt in some way, somehow, to uh, recreate. This is very weird that there's people here. <laughs> it's actually quite nice. Uh, uh, um, and I, 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 maybe that this is now going to be the new thing. Forget about this internet thing. Um, so I thought I, I, I thought I, I'm now I'm feeling very uncomfortable for some reason. So I thought I would start by doing something that I like to do that helps me feel a little more comfortable and read from um, this book, which is called uh, A Million Random Digits. Anybody have a, anybody have a request of which page you really like? <laughs> All right. <laughs> This is page 300, and uh, I'm, I'm going to actually go to page 322, and you can see if you can figure out why at some point. But uh, <clears throat> 10,403. Oh, wait. It's s story time. <laughs> 27,575. 95,942. It actually feels less weird to do this by myself in a room with a camera than with actual people out there, but. 86,331, 45,467, 75,467, 42,377, 47,681, 51,359, and 10,661. Okay, thank you. That was I'm glad. Appreciate you humoring me for me to attempt to do that. Um, I, I, I also I brought this uh, train whistle because, I don't know, I thought that would help. Um, so what I thought I would attempt to do, usually I spend at least 45 minutes doing absolutely nothing, and then eventually I get to some coding tutorials. <laughs> but since, I have a watch here, since uh, I'm, this is only supposed to be about 45 minutes in its entirety, um, I thought I would start by actually trying to code something I'm looking to where I'm supposed to look. So to the theme, okay, so first let me talk about something. The theme, one of the themes for a community is clouds. I don't know. Clouds, community. But cloud is one of the themes of Processing Day. And you might not actually be aware, if you look at, oh, I don't have my name tag on, but if you look at your name tag, each one of your name tags has a unique generative cr cloud created with P5.js. And so what I'm going to do is pull up right now um, this, uh, where do I want to go? So I want to go to um, Community clouds. So this is a GitHub repository. So first of all, by the way, if you happen to have a laptop with you and you want to like pull it out and like code some stuff along, I'm going to walk through making something and posting it to this um, GitHub repository. But this is a uh, GitHub repository called Community Clouds. And uh, if I scroll down, I'm going to go to this link right here. I'm going to open that in a new tab. And here you might recognize. And let's let's do something like uh, processing. You might recognize, like as I click, or I think if I use the arrow keys, it's going to scroll through all these different cloud designs. And you might recognize the cloud design that's on your name tag is one of the ones up here. And these are all have all been submitted by various um, viewers or processing programmers and artists and different people. So right here we can see this is I was looking for the one that's the one that has the train on it, but this is a nice one by Murigen DH, and you can. Uh, change some color and change your name, and I think even like download an SVG. Did that actually work? Let's go see what's there. Um, 
There we go. So this is what was used to generate the clouds that are on your name tags. The actual names are handwritten in. Uh, the font I'm told is Danielle. That's the font. Yeah. Danielle wrote most of them, but I, I, I think a variety of people wrote them. Um, so what I thought I would do today uh, is kind of try to do make a cloud design. And then uh, this cloud is, by the way, made by Simon, who is a seven-year-old. Uh, who Actually, he's just turned eight, and he lives in Antwerp. Um, and he's homeschooled and likes to watch coding videos all day long. Simon. I wanted to just give a shout out to Simon because he's a very dedicated viewer. Um, so um, I'm scrolling through these. Oh, here we go. This is uh, submitted by Niels Weber with a nice little cloud in a tree. Yay. All right. So <laughs> just, we're, we're doing this, I guess, aren't we? Um, so what I'm going to do, I also had this crazy idea that maybe I would try to do this at the same time in processing and P5.js. I thought if I had like a multiple monitor set up, I could kind of like do them both at the same time. That won't really work, but I can go back and forth between the two. So I'm going to try to come up with a technique. Maybe we're going to try to make the cloud look something like this. You can code along if you want. And then after, after I, a little bit of time, what I'll try to do, although maybe I'll just mention this right now, is there is a, uh, on this repository, there's a JavaScript file called generators.js. Um, me, I am so me. That's, um, Internet handle me, I am so me created this uh, system. So if I click on generators.js, what you'll actually see here is that this is just an example. If you write a function and that draws something, and you can actually even uh, return some values to define a rectangle of like where it's safe to draw text, but that's actually not even important. Just this writing a function to draw something, and then you add this line of code called register with the name of your func the name of your function, the name this this is. This could probably uh, use some help to be a little more um, explanatory. But I think this is supposed to be the title, like Processing Day Cloud. And then this would be the name Daniel Schiffman, or however you pronounce it. Um, so uh, and by the way, Jared Schiffman, who was mentioned a bunch of times this morning, I should point out, spells his name with a C, which I think is the correct spelling. So I apologize for my, the spelling of my name. It's no C. No relation. Uh, although I don't ever been in the same room at the same time. So um, there's internet conspiracy theory for you. OK, so um, let me go on here. This is not going nearly as well as I had imagined it was going to go. Um, all right, so let's try this. So I have this idea. Um, thank you, Taeyun, for taking down this whiteboard, which I did have a black mark for at one point. Oh, here it is. Um, so I thought I would do, uh, in order to create a cloud, so right now you see there's a P5.js sketch. And it's got, um, it's just using the ellipse function. So the ellipse function draws a circle. And one day, one, one way we could think about a cloud, I think, and by the way, I sort of also had this idea that people could like shout out suggestions. <laughs> Maybe that's like, go. we'll see if that works. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that was a bad idea. Um, if we think of this cloud as a, as a, if we think of this circle as having a radius, I'll call that R, the distance between the center and the edge. There is a way that we can compute all of the points around this circle based on uh, an angle relative to the x-axis. Maybe I could call that the Greek letter theta, which is often used for signifying an angle. You could also just say angle. <laughs> but I can compute all of these points by keeping the same radius and changing the angle. And that way, if I do that, I can use these functions that are in processing in P5 called begin shape and end shape set all these vertices, and I could draw exactly that same circle. So that's what I want to start with. If we can draw exactly that same circle, then we can, as a group, or just me, I don't know, <laughs> come up with some inter interesting ways to think about moving the, these points a little bit around. Because what is this cloud <laughs> other than an ellipse with some kind of like points of the ellipse kind of moved a little bit down? And it's actually interesting to think about. I was thinking of using a sine wave to start with. The sine wave is a nice pattern that looks like this. But I was actually just realizing if we take this bottom part and flip it up, I just thought of this actually while I was sitting in the other talk, uh, we could flip it up and uh, we might get something that looks kind of like this, which would be perhaps closely resembling this cloud. And I, I, and I have a feeling <laughs> that one of these, I'm sure if, we scroll, if I scroll through these, we would find one that does exactly that. But um, OK, so what do you guys, is that a good idea? Any, any suggestions? Yes. Perlin noise, okay, so that's good. So we should definitely, let me make a list here. Perlin noise is 
probably something that would be nice to fold in here. So one thing that's interesting about all these clouds, or most of them at least, is, uh, whoops, I, I lost that URL, um, is that you'll notice, I don't know what I, um, if I'm kind of like typing the name here, Oh, no, it's giving me a different cloud each time. But, I, but if I was keeping on the same, that's an interesting way to spell processing. Um, if I was keeping on the same cloud, each one of these will render itself a different way because it's a different algorithm. So you know, I might first start with a cloud that just looks the same every time. But this idea of procedural design, how could I have an algorithm that, that uh, its essence is the idea of this cloud, but it's going to be different every time it's run? All right. <laughs> Let's. I, uh, Let's go, let's go to P5. So by the way, this is actually the uh, P5.js uh, web editor presented by Cassie um, earlier this morning. And lots of other people have contributed to this thing. It's amazing. I haven't been using it in my videos yet, but I hope to eventually soon. But Cassie said, hey, go for it today. So I'm very excited to try. So one thing that I'm going to do, I'm not even logged in. <laughs> Let me log in. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, do I have it? Oh, I know. It. I have an account that I use for teaching. That one of the class that I teach now is called ICM. So let me do. Oops, I don't know the password. That's really not good. All right. Uh, usually, this is the point where I would like uh, waste about 20 minutes, like trying to look for the password for something while people are still arguing about whether like C++ or Java or something is faster in like the YouTube chat. That's generally what it what it is. Um, okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start with this idea of begin shape. And you shout out if you can't read something or if you have a question. Because this is like, instead of like a live YouTube chat that I'm kind of looking at trying to answer questions, you are real people with real voices in, in real life. Uh, they are too, right. Good point. Ah, I feel uh, all right, so um, I'm going to just start. I'm just going to do something really simple just to start like the, the really basics. I'm going to say vertex 100-100. Vertex 200, 100. Vertex 200, 200, just to see that this idea works. Vertex 100, 200. So what I try to do there in my head is kind of think about the points of a square. So you know, 100, 100, 200, 100. You can see this path that gets filled. And uh, one thing I can do here under end shape is I can add close. And now it closes it. So, it's sort of hard for you to see this because of the projector quality, but if I zoom in, you can see what I've done now is I've unpacked the function that draws a square, and I've drawn it with individual vertices, which means you know, I could do something like if I wanted to, this first vertex could be uh, determined by where the mouse is. So, that's, so I have this dynamic shape. So what I want to do now is <laughs> how much time do I have? I will refer you to my video tutorial. You can go out in the hallway and watch it about polar Cartesian court. No, that's not a good idea. So what you need to, in order to do this, we need to do a little bit of math. And uh, the math comes from a, a field of mathematics called trigonometry, the study of uh, the sides, the relationship between the angles of a right triangle and the sides of a triangle. If you know what, I, I drew this kind of poorly, but this makes a triangle here. So if this is an angle, and this is the radius of that circle, I want to calculate that points how far to move across the x and how far to move up the y. And I, do, I, do, I wasn't joking. I do have a video tutorial where I go through this in a bit more detail. But the, it turns out there's a really nice formula for that, which I can say x equals r times cosine of theta and y equals r times sine of theta. So the reason why, it's, it's, you know, I kind of like this idea of saying, oh, and by the way, I need let now. I don't know what that means exactly. but. I'm a let person, in case you were wondering. I think you're also, there's a thing called const, which I haven't fully wrapped my head around. But someday, I'm going to be a const person. Very const. Uh, so let r equal, and, and I should probably say something like radius. I have a bad habit of using one letter variable names. So if I say radius equals 100, and I say uh, angle equals, and I want to say 45 degrees, wouldn't it be nice, and I'm going to get rid of this now. I mean, we're going to need begin shape and end shape again. I'm going to put this console down here just to give myself a little more space. Um, wouldn't it be nice if I could just say something like point radius comma angle? And where is that point? It's there. Is that it? Or is that a smudge on my screen? No, there it is. So I, I drew a point, but it's drawing at a value x. So it doesn't matter what I call a variable name. I could pick up, I could call it you know, unicorn and puppy. It's not going to draw a unicorn. It's just the name that I made. So 
What I want, it, um, P5 and most computer graphics systems only think in terms of Cartesian coordinate systems, which is the XY stuff. So that I can take those formulas and I could say let X equal radius times, what did I say, cosine of the angle? And I can say let Y equal radius times sine of the angle. I'm trying to check the time. And, um, and then I could say point X comma Y. And then, where's that point now? Is, it there? is that a smudge or is that the point? Oh, there it is. So where is it? It's actually, is it 45 degrees from where? So let me draw a line from 0, 0 to that. That'll help us see it a little better. Stroke weight 4. And let me say line 0, 0, x, y. So what actually happened is I'm drawing it at a rotation of 45, but not degrees. So that's the other thing I have to remember is that most computer graphics programming systems don't, you know, I might think of like this is 180 degrees, this is 90 degrees of this, like that's how I intuitively think of angles in a unit of measurement called degrees. But most computer graphics systems use a unit of measurement called radians. <laughs> Insert link to other video tutorial about radians maybe, I don't know. Um, so uh, I, don't, you can, I don't know if you can insert a hyperlink on a whiteboard, but did I just, does anybody even say hyperlink anymore? Is that a thing? <laughs> um, so, uh, but one thing I can do with P5, which is rather nice, is I could say angle mode degrees. So I can actually just have it think in terms, and now you can see, oh, it is actually a 45 degrees. It's actually, you can see that line is at a 45 degree angle. But I want to think about this from the center. So one thing I can do to do that is I can say translate. I better save this. It's too late now, I think. Um, we're going to, by the way, I'm hoping in this session we're also going to debug a little uh, bug that I, that's in the web editor where sometimes if you have auto refresh on, it kind of crashes. So maybe we're, and, and all of you can file, <laughs> everyone can file a GitHub issue all together at once. and It'll be like four unknown. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do now, if I can retain my train of thought, is, oh, right, I was saying translate. So first of all, I'm going to save this. Let's, first, I'm going to make a, give it a name. This is called uh, Proce Processing Community Day Cloud. Let's do that. And I'm going to hit Save. Now, incidentally, if this is a little bit hard for you to just like memorize or track down. But if you go to this link right now, which is uh, alpha editor p 5 jsorg slash ICM sketches, and then this crazy sequence of characters, you will actually open up the code that I'm typing. It won't update in real time. We don't have, some, we don't have that kind of fancy real time mind meld thing going on just yet. But um, if you want to start with the code that I have, you could certainly do that. And if, you're log if you've logged into your own account, the thing you can actually do is you can say uh, duplicate. So you actually won't see an option for save because you're opening a sketch from my account. You'll see an option called duplicate, which you can then duplicate and then save. But um, we'll, see, we'll see how uh, well things work for you if you're using this. So I'm going to say translate to width divided by 2, height divided by 2. And now. There it is. Now at least I'm drawing this line from the center. And what would happen, by the way, if I just made this angle a global variable, and I just said something like angle plus plus? So we can see this line is now spinning because I'm just changing the angle. The radius is not changing. If I made the radius a global variable, I don't know if this has a point to it. I was going to actually just make it a random value. Uh, if I made the radius something random. You can see it's doing that as it's spinning around. So right now, I'm just showing you how to trace that path. But instead of doing, doing it as an animation, what if I did all of the points around the circle uh, one time through draw? And to do that, all I would need to do is say for uh, what? Let angle equal 0. Uh, angle, I, you can't not do this without typing i. Angle is less than, I don't know, 360 degrees. Angle plus plus. And let's try to. See if I can create a little bit of additional space here so the code is visible. Oh, that's not going to be enough space for this. And then if I do this, and then I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Oh, let's get rid of this angle plus plus and do this. There we go. Whoa, and the radius is changing like crazy. Um, OK, ah, there we go. So now you can see I've drawn all those lines. I don't want them to be lines. Let's look at them as points. Uh, there's so many of them, which is kind of unnecessary right now. Let's go five degrees for every point. There we go. We can see. So I've traced these. And by the way, interestingly enough, if I say, uh, well, I was going to say x radius. <laughs> but another term for that might be width. But a half width, I don't know what to call it. I'm going to call it x radius. That's probably like a weird thing to call it. And y radius, if I make the x radius 200, you can see this is now how I now have 
an elliptical path. Okay, we're, we're somewhere. Let's make it even lower resolution, 15. Let's save. Let's do save as like 15 times so we keep all of our old versions when we, yeah. um, Okay, so now what I want to do, begin shape, end shape, and uh, vertex. Ta-da! Yay, there, we made a circle. Is it, can we be done now? <laughs> it's very kind of you to applaud the, the sort of badly drawn circle that doesn't. Ah, so let's add close. It is interesting to see here. Let's add also, um, just for right now, let me say no fill. Um, and then we can see here, and, um, and then I'm, gonna, I'm like overly neurotic about spacing. I'm going to move that over a little bit. So I'm tempted to translate this into processing because I said I was going to do them both, but maybe I'll try to do that more at the end. So now we're somewhere. Anybody have any questions or thoughts or ideas? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, like, the picture isn't saying like, uh, stroke weight and no fill. Are those always global, or could they be tied to specific objects? It's a great question. So those functions, they, they almost they set a global state in a way. So it's, they, they, this, there's a state of, in a way, you can almost think of the P5 or processing system as there's you know, a person with a, a marker or a big bag of markers who's like ready to go. I've got some thick markers, some thin ones, a bunch of different colors. So every time you would set something like, say, fill 255, 00, processing, the brain would kind of go and pull out the red marker. It's going to use it continuously until you say, fill something else. So um, it's, it, they really do apply. If, 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 I only, if I put stroke weight four, no fill, everything I draw on this entire sketch will have those. But if I had something at the bottom where it was like, oh, I'm also drawing you know, a little rectangle at the top right corner. Um, oops, by the way, I, I translated the center to the center, which is easy to forget that I've done that. I was like, why is that not in the top? I was thought it would be in the top left. Um, but if I wanted to put it in the top left, I could say like minus 200. Minus 200, but the point of what I was saying is now, if I give this a different setting, so to speak, you're going to see that um, we've got red there now. So it's really up to you to manage that, to figure out, like, I want, I, I need to collect pieces of my code together. And ultimately, a nice way of managing that is with something called, one way of managing that was something called object-oriented programming, which I am avoiding for the sake of today. Other questions or ideas? Uh, yes. So oh, yeah. Make that a variable. Yeah. Annoy yeah. So that's a great idea. So actually, that's what I mean. Um, so this should, you know, you could, I think you could make the argument that any time you see a number that's not written as a variable, you might want to make that a variable so that you can adjust it and play with it. And actually, one of the really things, this is one of the things I love about P5. Let's do this. I'm like, I, I'm like, uh, I got to get to the cloud part. But let's say I made that a variable and I called it. And by the way, I've done something kind of weird and awkward here, which I put my variable definitions in between setup and draw. Yeah, it's fine. Um, uh, step size equals 15. So we can see this if I make this step size. And one of the things I want to try to do right now is I'm going to say, I'm going to create something called, and this is something you can't easily do in processing. Okay, hold on. Uh, now I can't live with myself anymore. I'm going to move this up here. <laughs> it works either way. Um, and this should, I think this, this one's probably supposed to be const. I think it's supposed to be const. Somebody will teach me about const after this. Uh, slider equals create slider. And this is part of a library that's part of, hmm, did it appear anywhere? Hold on, let me give it some numbers. Zero, oh, we're gonna have to do some debugging. Um, uh, hold on, uh, five, 50, uh, 25. Do you see a slider anywhere over here? Oh wait, let's try stop and start. Okay, maybe, oh, the problem happened. Or let's look at the console. Oh good, we're ha I was worried that we wouldn't have any bugs. Oh, no bug here. Okay, we must go to level two here. Uh, view, developer, here it comes. <laughs> uh, JavaScript console, that was, ah, okay. So I think we did actually, um, so this is the bug that, um, I'm, let me go to GitHub right now. I'm gonna show you, I, I really would love help figuring this bug out. I know that Cassie would too. And uh, I think it was originally reported by Kate, who, uh, who's uh, at UCLA and was a Google Summer of Code. Student who worked on WebGL, Kate's awesome. So I'm gonna, Kate Hollenbach. So hold on, uh, processing P5. 
P5, I, I love that this bug came up live. Oh no, not website. Uh, editor, web editor, oh my god, there's too many. Do I have the URL memorized? I do. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna go into issues and I'm gonna go look down here. This, can't save sketch, sketch corrupted. So this is an error that um, we could see that I posted. So one thing, here's the thing about filing good and helpful bug reports. I'm not saying that I've done this, but uh, it's hard for you to, to, follow, to read some of this text, but you can see Kate first posted about this error, uh, had the same error. I tried to um, I, uh, figure out, I noticed that it was only happening when autofresh related, and then I, this actually was during class. I had a different GitHub account. We kind of figured out that this code caused this error, but I think what would be really useful, if anyone wants to take this as a project under themselves for the afternoon, would be to try to maybe do a screencast and like leave the JavaScript console open, put auto refresh on, see if you can figure out an exact sequence of characters to type in the web editor that causes this error to happen. I will tell you that right now, if this error happens for you, you the strategy to get around this error is, uh, this is very fancy, select all, copy, <laughs> refresh, <laughs> reload, and it'll be at some state before it broke. Ah, look at that. The single apostrophe. Oh. Yeah, I know. I, I'm a little afraid to use my pathetic soundboard effects too much. But um, so I wonder if I've already broken it again. But I'm just going to go paste. And then I'm going to try doing this. Oh, now we have the slider. So what I wanted to show you, which is exciting, about you working in the browser is you can get some of these uh, interface elements for free, essentially. This is just a plain uh, vanilla, I guess, is what's often referred to, a Java uh, HTML5 input element, a range element. It's a slider. And P5, the DOM library, has some nice hooks into that. So I could say um, here, step size equals slider dot value. So now, if I do this, we can see that I can kind of like work with the resolution of that particular, and, I, and I, what you might be wondering, well, what is this range? This is the range. So the range is between five and 50, and the default value is 25. So if I wanted to kind of, and I didn't want to put it at zero. If I put it at zero, I've got a problem, because if this value ever gets to be zero, we're gonna have an infinite loop uh, browser crashing thing. Okay, so I made that a, a, a little thing we can play with. That should be interesting. Let me give it a bigger range just to, um, uh, and start at something like this. Okay, gotta keep moving here, it's three o'clock. <laughs> usually I'm like, I have to leave and go home for dinner, but that's not what's happening now. So I'm usually, never mind. I don't know how many have actually watched one of these live streams, I really don't recommend that you watch them. <laughs> you can watch the, uh, Mathieu by the way is here, you can raise your hand in the audience. He helps with all of the video editing from, and he's from, uh, originally from Montreal, yes, but living somewhere else in Canada right now. Um, okay. So uh, what do I want to do here? Okay, so let's try this sine wave idea. Now, interestingly enough, I'm already using like sine and cosine. So this is kind of this crazy thing going on, whereas the idea of the sine function, the trigonometry function sine, is that it calculates the value of, in a right triangle, of the length of the opposite side of the angle divided by the hypotenuse, which in this case is y divided by r. Sine of the angle equals y divided by r. And so um, you can see how this formula is just another way of writing that. But it just also so happens that if you take the sine of a value and you just increment that value over time, you get a number that oscillates between, that's positive one and negative one, smoothly. And it doesn't, you could, this is, so it's a wave pattern. This is, this would not be smooth. This would be perfectly linear, like a, like a triangle wave, I think it's sometimes called. Somebody who knows about sound or something will know something about this. Whereas this is more like a sine wave. So what I want to do is apply the sine wave somehow to this x radius and y radius. So I could probably reuse that angle, because I already have this value that's incrementing. But let's kind of be safe. And let's just, I'm going to, this might be a bad idea, but I'm going to just have a different variable called a. And what I want to do is I want to basically say that x radius equals, I'm going to say 200 plus some offset, and y radius equals, what did I set those values up as originally? I mean, these should be local variables now. I've got to clean this all up later, it's fine. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, what, what, did, what did I say? 100 plus offset. So the idea here is that I, want, I need to have some sort of offset. 
So that's no offset. That's an offset of 100, just making every radii bigger. But now if I can have the offset oscillate differently, so between plus 1 and negative 1. So if I were to say sine of a times 20, and now the angle's the same, and sine of 0 is, what is that, 1, 0? Somebody knows. Um, <laughs> it's very stressful to do math in front of a live audience. <laughs> Try it, really. It's like some people are good at it. It's not me. Um, OK, so, um, so but now I can increase that angle. So I think what would be interesting here is to say something like this. Mm, let's increase it more. Eh, let's increase it more. Let's, there, ooh, this is looking great now. There we go. That looks totally like a cloud, right? <laughs> oh my god, this is terrible. Um, so. Um, it's no, I, didn't I change it to degrees? Everything is now in degrees. So, um, so interestingly enough, I have a feeling that the step size is, is going to be our friend here. Oh, we want it to be smaller. Oh, there we go. That kind of looks more like the sine wave. You know, I probably could, if I just kind of like got rid of that stroke rate of four, it's going to appear so much, oh, it looks so much smoother now. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to just, for the moment, let's give an initial step size of um, five. And OK, so here we go. Can I go now? No, I have to keep going. So here's, let's at least try. The, what I like to do with my YouTube channel is make really ugly stuff, because I don't have any talent in that area, but at least kind of hopefully explain it somewhat well. And then people with talent make it beautiful. So that's sort of what I'm hoping will happen here, because I haven't. Um, but let's at least go this one further step, a couple further steps. One is, let's think about the absolute value. Uh, um, let's think about never letting a sign oscillate back down to negative 1. So what if as it's oscillating towards negative 1, it stops and keeps going right back up? I think we could achieve that instantly with the absolute value. <laughs> oh, perfect. That's just what I was hoping would. Maybe I should prepare these in advance. That could be good. Um, let's make the canvas a little bit uh, wider, just so we can kind of see this better. And in, we, can, you know, we got some variables we can play with here to do all sorts of strange things. All right. So this is the basic idea. Let's just pretend, just because just I, I want to add the sort of pearl and noise thing and think about some ways to make it smoother. And we could try curve vertex. That's a way to maybe smooth it out. Um, but let me, at least, let me at least show you. Let's say you were following along. And you, you arrived at this moment, and it still has that weird red rectangle over there, which I almost feel like we need to leave in, because it, like, it must mean something, right? I'll comment it out. Um, so one of the things I can do now is I can go to here. Let's see. So this, this, um, this is a, uh, this system which generates that website. If you have never made a pull request before on GitHub, this might be a place for you to give it, give it a try. I was, this is a pr hopefully fairly friendly. So you do, in, if you haven't done a pull request before, so this is the URL. I guess I'll try to like publish all these URLs or tweet them or something like that, or this will get recorded. Anyway, you can, can't find it. It's uh, github.com slash coding train community clouds. And you, would have to, you do have to have a GitHub account, but once you're signed into your account, oh, and I'm logged in as myself somehow. That's going to be a little bit of a problem, but that's fine. Um, uh, there's this button right here. So <laughs> for only $19.95, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, I have tutorials on Git and GitHub that you could get outside. No, I don't. But uh, if you want to know more about Git and GitHub, I also have some other tutorials. But so without the full story, what I basically can do is this edit says, I want to propose a change to this file. So if I click Edit, and the MIT Media Lab Magical Internet uh, will then land me in here. And I can now, I'm in a text editor. I'm going to zoom in so you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to write function, I'm going to call this PCD Cloud. And I'm just going to write a function with an open curly bracket and a closed curly bracket. Then I'm going to rather, in a oh, terrifying way, oh, I'm uh, go back to here. And I'm going to think about, OK, what have I done? Let's see, one thing that we could be sure about to uh, yeah, the slider's going to be a problem. There's a few things that I've done. I don't know if this translate's going to be a problem. Hmm. It's OK. Everything can be fixed later. So I'm going to go grab all this code. And I'm going to just the code that draws this design idea. And this is for a fixed design. I'm going to now come and paste it in here. 
And there it is. So let's look at this a little bit. Okay, step size, well, let's try five. And probably uh, these variables need to be eyeballing code and just assuming it's going to work is generally not a good idea, <laughs> but why not? You should, you should live on the edge. Okay. Um, so here we go. So now what I need to do is I also need to register this function. So I'm going to say, what did I call it? PCD cloud. I'm going to call it uh, processing community day. Uh, let me just call it PCD cloud. <laughs> PCD cloud. And then I'm, this is by processing community. <laughs> Ah, it's very hard to spell in front of people, too. OK, so now I'm going to go, um, I'm going to go down. Now, here's the thing. I have this nice, fancy button, because of all this power that I wield on the internet. Not, I have this button that says commit changes, which means it's going to commit directly to the master branch, which is that's just a fancy word for that's the actual code that's running on the web page. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Oh, live corrections. This is awesome. Usually, I, usually I, I find out about it like two weeks later, and I have a sleepless night of something that I totally messed up. Thank you. Um, so uh, now I'm going to go down. This is very hard to do this all with Zoom. Let's see. Let me zoom out. Scroll down. Oops, scroll over here. OK. So um, you won't see this option because you, un unless you're me, which might be an interesting like Freaky Friday thing to try. But, um, uh, you, you can, what you'll probably see is some variation of this, but basically you want to propose this. I'm going to simulate not being myself and proposing this change. And actually, I don't know, me, I am so me who has been, uh, they've been helping me um, manage these pull requests, might actually be in England somewhere live on the internet, not watching this, but waiting for me to do this, because I mentioned I might try to do this. <laughs> and maybe it'll, get, maybe it'll get merged. So I'm going to hit propose file change. And once I do that, you think you're done, but it's like reminding me, OK, this is live from processing day. I don't have anything else to say. Still live from processing day. And I spelled live wrong. Um, this is an ugly cloud that I made. It's not ugly. Let's not be mean to the cloud. This is a cloud that I made as an example. It's a All clouds are beautiful. OK, so now I'm going to create the pull request. I'm going to request <laughs> me, I am so me to uh, review it. <laughs> and then I'm going to hit uh, create pull request. And now one of the things that, that we've created this pull request, I could actually just go and merge it. Maybe I will. One thing we could do just to sort of see is I could say file change. One thing that's nice here is if I were the one reviewing it, and I could say, um, you know, maybe you should learn about const, which is definitely a comment I get a lot. Add a single comment. Okay, so um, so uh, you can't. I forget that you can't exactly see what I'm typing. So this is the idea. So I have now made a cloud. I have registered a pull request. I don't. I'm not going to merge it. Let's. What, what do we have? Like ten more minutes here. So I think what I would do is I would like to either um, take questions, which could be just about anything. Like I can. <laughs> I was going to say step out of character, but there is no, it's just me. Um, but uh, I could read some more random numbers. But, um, but I can answer questions that are more meta if people are interested in like about teaching or processing or about how this like what YouTube stuff if you want to ask. I could also take a few. I didn't get to the Pearl and Noise suggestion, which is like an excellent one. So I might leave that as an exercise. But if there's some time or you have a suggestion, I'm happy to try it. But let me see what questions there might be. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, good, great question. So um, one of the reasons why. Um, the web editor isn't fully out there. It's like Cassie, I think, said, like open secret or something. Is because we, A, we haven't taken the time to announce it and make sure all of the people have put so much time and work into it get our, um, have a nice moment to get credit for all of this work. And also because we haven't fully documented and uh, information about how to use it. So that question easily could come up. So this is all actually hosted on Amazon Web Services. So um, I don't mean to get so technical here, but it's running. Um, there's a, it's an AWS instance, so there's a server, and it has your account, your name, and your password stored, encrypted. And so your code is saved in the database associated with your account. Um, you can, if right now, if I wanted to do file download, it will download a zip 
of all of the code. And another thing that I'm not showing you here, if I go over to the, here as you can see, this is actually, these are the files associated with this particular sketch. It's just a CSS file. If I wanted to add that, which I'm, I'm not, uh, it's an index.html file which has references to the P5 libraries, and then this is the actual code that I'm writing. And so the reason why you know, we make these kind of decisions, and we've talked about this and gone back and forth, but the idea is that that is not open at first, and this is meant to be a, um, a platform. You know, I like to think of the audience for this as like, it's three hours on a Saturday, and people want to learn something about programming and make something, um, and be able to share it really quickly on so I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to keep showing you all these other features, but A, I want to let um, others who have actually developed all these features show those when the time comes. And also, I would just be here for hours if I started like, thinking about all that weird stuff. Show you here. Um, yes? Uh, so if I know that URL, I can see your code. Yeah. Yes. Um, is the intention for that to always be true? Yes. So the intention is for that to always be true. I mean, currently right now, oops, sorry, there is no distinction between public and private sketches. In a way, like everything's private because you could never find it if you don't know the URL. But on that, on the other hand, everything's public because there's no nothing's hidden behind anything if you have the URL. So the intention is to, and actually, this has been a really amazing tool for me teaching. In that, I work on an example in class. I used to jump through all these hoops to either like email it to the students or like post it to GitHub or I. Custom. Now I just send them an email after class with links to five sketches. And of course, there's, you can imagine so many more possible features in terms of the classroom. I've seen Sanan here in the audience here, who's developed something called Open Processing, which is has a lot of similar features to the web editor, but is much more geared towards this, that social aspect of being able to collect and share and teach with uh, collections of sketches. And this really, at the moment, is just focusing on kind of the editing, the code editing experience. Yeah, but so definitely if you're for teaching, another web editor that we definitely check out is openprocessing.org. Yeah. If you actually go to the URL with, without the last part, you can see all oh, the yeah. sketches. Yeah, yes. Yes. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the behind the scenes of coding training. Yeah. And what your setup is. Sure, like. definitely. I, so I, a long time, I'm going to show, a long time ago I made, if I Google video lesson documentation Schiffman, I think this um, comes up with a blog post from, this is from 2013. So this is pretty out of date, but the system I'm using is mostly the same. So, I, um, so what I have is, uh, this actually used to be my, this is my office at NYU, but I, I found a closet that had some filing cabinets and I was like, can we use this, can I use this room? Just move the filing cabinets to the side. So I uh, painted, painted a wall green, um, have a standing desk and a computer and a machine and a camera. So everything goes through one uh, Mac tower, the camera input, the, the input from my laptop, the input from the mic, um, and I'm using software. I used to use software called Wirecast, which is commercial software for live broadcasting, and I recently started using something called Open Broadcasting Studio. And so, um, this is that. So, you know, I don't know to, to what, you know, I kind of have jumped through all these hoops to kind of have an elaborate setup um, in terms of a green screen and live compositing and like, you know, an iPad with sound and this to try to be as sort of goofy and creative with it as possible. Um, the truth of the matter is there's no reason why I couldn't just download this right now, um, turn on my webcam, you know, put my face in the corner and live stream me doing this. I could have just done that from this room right now. Maybe I should have done that. But, um, but so I would encourage people, if you're interested, to don't, to like try it. Um, and I'm happy to help. I can be helpful to anyone. One of the things that I've really been trying to do, and I, I promised myself I wouldn't open up my YouTube page in this, but there's no other way. Uh, all right, avert your eyes for a minute. Um, I guess I just have to avert my own eyes. I, one of the things that I'm trying to do is have more and more guests. So if I go to playlists, quickly, we're gonna get off of this before this even starts playing. Playlists, um, uh, guests. Oh, the, YouTube, by the way, YouTube, this is being, YouTube is great, yay, YouTube. It has its issues. It's been wonderful for me to be able to discover it, but I think if I click here, it gives me all playlists. No, save playlist. This is nuts. I ran into this the other day, created playlists. This is showing me featured playlists, there we go. Um, I would like to look, see, uh, here's Tiga, I think, who's somewhere, I saw, thought I saw Tiga's face. No, I saw Claire's face, who's down here. So I've been trying to have more guests, here we go, guest tutorials and interviews. Uh, and, um, sorry, um, there's Claire, look. Um, so this is something that I'm trying to do more of. 
uh, which is two, there's two aspects of this. One is that studio that I have in New York. I'm opening it up at the moment for like students and other people who work at NYU to use it. Um, if anybody's interested or knows somebody who wants to make a video tutorial, and I'm opening it up for people to make video tutorials and own and take that content anywhere they want. I have discovered that people seem to enjoy publishing a tutorial through my channel, just because it has now it has this sort of built-in audience. It has you know, pros and cons there. But so one of the things I'm trying to do is um, create opportunities and think about ways for um, uh, more voices and faces and people from different backgrounds and uh, places in the world um, to be able to make tutorials as well. So that's, um, that's one thing that I'm really interested in and was kind of, in a way, the original idea <laughs> for like setting up this more uh, prop, this studio thing. Um, yes? Uh, how, how did you approach your classes uh, kind of pedagogically? Did yeah. you talk about the distinction yeah. between the kind of progression of the videos and your theory? Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I don't know if everybody heard that question. But you can ask it again, because so I'm still I'm, thinking about I'm, it. <laughs> ask, I'm asking him to, to, to kind of talk about how, yeah. how, how you think pedagogically about sort of individual courses right. versus, versus this kind of years right. long progress and, and right. co hopefully more years of Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And it's one that I really struggle with and don't have like a clear like, oh, I know. I know how it all works. This is it. But it's definitely something that I'm trying to find. About. I do think of what I'm doing uh, with these video tutorials as something very different than, some, than what happens in a classroom setting or, you know, potentially, this is very presentational, but what could be more like a workshop setting in person. Um, it's my hope that these videos support classroom settings. But um, and they and I and and mostly um, a lot of times what I end up the videos I think of as in a similar way as um, similar to how a textbook might support a classroom setting. But certainly one of the things I aspire to do more is less like which is which is weird for me to say because it's basically all I do on the YouTube channel. But less like let me just show you how to do stuff and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and more. Let's try something together. Let's, uh, uh, let's ask the questions. Let's try to solve it together. So more interactive workshop exercises in class type stuff. And part of the reason why I like try to do these videos in theory is to try to allow more time for that in class, to have fall back to some more presentational content if that's a useful way to learn it. And one thing that I do think is really important to state is that everybody learns in a different way and that while these videos are hopefully useful to some people, they are not useful to other people. There's you know, questions around accessibility, of course, as well. I mean, you know, not all these videos are captioned. So this is something that I really have to, hopefully, will continue to be more thoughtful about, engage more people with, to try to figure out better ways to, to reach more people and be more inclusive. Yes? Hi. Um, first thing I want to say, you're awesome. <laughs> and I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> OK. Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would you have, as, as an educator, would you have like, some kind of high level advice for other people who are trying to teach mm. these techniques of using programming and being creative and being expressive in other settings, like yeah. classrooms or even on the other online practices? Yeah, it's a, what it's, would you recommend other people? Yeah, um, well, to be very broad and kind of open ended about it, I would say to me the things that are important for me to keep in mind are don't make any assumptions about what people know. Uh, every, uh, and like, just, and um, so th th don't make any assumption about what people know. Slow down. Let things have time to breathe. Um, don't, and, and then just try to find the stuff that you're excited about and, and, and show that excitement through teaching. So I think that when you're engaged and excited about trying something, the people who are part of the learning process will be more apt to be engaged, I think about learning that as well. But really, I thought more important is just that I think it's really difficult, and I fall into this trap all the time. I was saying API the other day in a, in a context, like over and over and over again. And finally, somebody said, what's an API? And you know, and you know that person, like it took a lot of courage to ask that question, because that person probably thought, no, everybody else in the room knows, and I'm the one who does it. Why are you all wondering what API is, maybe? Um, I, my video tutorial on, it's like a, this is like my, uh, sales pitch here. Um, but um, so this is something that I think to be able to create an environment where people feel comfortable doing that is really important. I'm not saying I know how to do that, but it's something I aspire to do or try to do. I saw there was another question here. Yeah. Um, 
it was actually quite similar to that <laughs> one. Um, but it's more like, what do you think are qualities of a person who's uh, trying to be an educator that people recognize you as being kind of like successful as, at being able to transmit kind of like this high level right. or, or technical stuff in a approachable way. And that's what I think that people really appreciate. And what, I, if you can, ex what can you extract from your experience that might be, that people might be able to kind of like translate and right. incorporate into their own? I don't know. I yeah, mean, it's yeah, kind it's of a good, it's a difficult questions. I mean, one, one thing I would say is that it's always helpful for me when I get feedback from people saying, oh, the way that this was or something, this, this didn't make sense to me or this did, and I'm kind of accumulating that knowledge and iterating. So I think that having some kind of dialogue and feedback system um, is, is, is certainly a part of the process. I mean, for me, I, um, you know, I would, and it's hard to, uh, you know, I, I would, learn things the best once I had to teach them. So I think it's kind of having that, uh, you have to, ch um, I don't know what the right way to phrase this is, because, um, but you know, I think maybe if I just think about this kind of trigonometry stuff for a, set, for a moment, like this might have been stuff that when I was first learning to code, I was kind of using and sort of understand, but until I had to explain it to somebody, I didn't feel like I maybe understood it myself. I understood it in a new way once I had to explain it to someone. And I spent a lot of time um, just helping people individually. And that's actually still my favorite, as much as I love doing this YouTube stuff and it's kind of like insane and, and interesting and this weird thing that's kind of happened to me for my life. But I, the thing that I enjoy most is like one-on-one -on -one <laughs> uh, helping people with code stuff. It's just so, and I think that's where I, um, as a student, I was always helping other students, so I think this, um, one thing I would say if you wanna get started and think about teaching, teach to one person. You know, that's like a really good, comfortable and interesting and rewarding place to start um, uh, practice. Like I mean, I, to be honest, like I, I, uh, I don't know if I, I taught this course where I, I, machine learning is kind of like this field that I'm trying to figure out if I can teach, and I tried to do a course at ITP in the spring that I felt was kind of a total mess. And I hadn't had experience that for a while because it's kind of doing the same thing over and over again. So it's to remember that you have to do things more than once and kind of get that kind of practice and figure out what works. Uh, yes. You can shout it out if. Uh, so like I was just wondering, like as a YouTube creator, does places like Patreon or like the YouTube itself, call it financially right. reliable? Are right. they? Yeah, so just this, is, this is a really good question also. I am all sorts of conflicted, confused feelings about this. So to, uh, I like to try to explain this as transparently as I can. So on the one hand, I'm lucky to have this full-time job that allows me to experiment in weird directions working at NYU. So it allows me to have the time to do stuff like this without it being like a primary source of income. At the same time, I, you'll, you will notice that I do have ads turned on on the videos, and I derive a small income from that, and I have this Patreon, which is like a Kickstarter, but like a monthly thing. So I'm interested in experimenting with these models in um, number one, to learn about them, number two is it's earning the extra money is useful. Um, I also use the money, I, I, I mentioned Mathieu here and some other um, people who I sometimes can get to work on different projects, putting it back into the channel. I've been trying to figure out a system for paying guest honorariums. So in a way, I kind of stumbled into this small business. Um, and uh, I, you know, at this point, it's really a small, small business, but it might grow beyond that, and I haven't figured out how to manage that. And, side, it's like a side project that I maybe do once a week. Um, I'm just, I feel like lucky if I made a few new videos. But I know that other uh, YouTube creators, they do really do this full time and it, it's a whole, there's a lot to worry about and figure out and YouTube, you know, I also feel conflicted about using YouTube as a platform. It's been great for me and that I've reached a new audience that I never knew was there, but it's also a very specific audience of people who watch YouTube and that comes with its own limitations. And so, and um, how to make the videos more accessible more broadly, and how to create financial sustainable models that I can do this, that other people could also do this, is definitely something I'm interested in. I hope that answers the question somewhat. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, I've noticed you've covered a lot of different subjects, most recently being machine learning. Yeah. Um, I was kind of just wondering two things. A, have you decided what you're going to do next? 
be what drives you to choose the subjects? Yeah. Is it community feedback, et cetera? Um, yeah, so at the moment, mostly I make my decisions based on like things that come up in class that week. So I teach on Tuesday and Wednesdays, mm -hmm. and then I live stream on Friday. And I usually like, I'm scrolling down notes of like, oh, I didn't get to this, or this, inter this student had an interesting question. So I'm trying right now, it just sort of works best for my life to like align it as much as possible. Um, over the summer, I had planned to kind of like branch out into machine learning and kind of got tripped up there. <laughs> uh, I had a bicycle accident, so I didn't mean to make a pun there, but now I can explain. Um, but um, so I kind of fell behind on that. I guess I'm, one, of, one of the things that I'm really trying to do is make sure that the tutorials and channel are watchable for the beginner kind of always. So it doesn't mean every video, if you've never learned programming before, you can just walk in and like watch it. But there's some sequencing and there's some different levels. But um, to me, that's the thing I really try to keep in the back of my hand because some of the loudest voices, at least, in getting suggestions and comments of what people want me to cover, I think are people who have more experience or maybe more for, feel more comfortable requesting or asking. So it's hard to find that. But I know that there's, I know that there's quieter voices out there who, are, who, who want and enjoy and, and uh, learn from the, the really beginner stuff. So I really would love any suggestions or ideas on how to better manage kind of like choosing the content. I think I'm probably supposed to wrap up. I don't see like somebody, right? Because I don't know if anybody has a, their eye on the schedule, but maybe I'll take one more question. Or maybe there are no more questions. Uh, question? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, what, what, just what led you to create your channel in the first place? Like, what was the, um, the Yeah, uh, well, first, it's a, first I was recording my uh, actual physical classes. And I thought, well, what if I record those and students could watch them back if they miss class or in the evening or something? And that didn't really work. It was an interesting document, but it wasn't, it didn't have the, didn't work to watch unless you were in the class, basically. Um, and they were long and they were messy. And then there, I was worried about privacy and other people in the video. So then I started making some videos just for my courses and um, just trying it out and trying different ways of doing it. And, um, at one point, I think I had made, like, I, I looked this up the other day. I don't know, some of these are private and unlisted videos, but there's like over 600 videos on my channel, which is kind of insane. But I think at one point I had made 100 videos. I was mostly putting them on Vimeo. And somebody said, emailed me and said, I'd really like to watch these on YouTube because they have the 2x feature. By the way, if you watch me at half speed, my <laughs> kids who are six and nine, their favorite things to watch me on half speed, they'd die laughing. I don't think they, they really, I mean, I'd sound really drunk or something. Um, it's very bizarre, like me on, on half speed. But anyway, uh, so somebody wanted to watch them at the faster speed, which Vimeo didn't have. And so I just dumped the catalog there. And I, you know, YouTube has more of a system for people to find videos based on whatever. And so um, at some point, I thought I would try live streaming. Somewhere in there, you can find this, like, Live stream number one, test. You can watch that where I was trying to figure out. I think it's actually a Google Hangout is what it is with like I'm like screen sharing and stuff like that. So it just was a step-by-step -step, um, kind of thing. Yeah, I, I probably made the first video tutorial though after I had been teaching for like seven or eight years. So it wasn't like I was doing this from the beginning. Great, I think I see people like coming in, which probably means we're supposed to. The, by the way, the best part of today, I think, is going to be these uh, lightning talks for people in the community. I was looking at the list and seeing all this exciting stuff. So I definitely don't want to take ep any time that could be 340. Yeah, but we should probably give 10 minutes for people to get set up and stuff. So I think our time is good. Um, if you didn't get a sticker, because <laughs> I'm like the merchandise person. First of all, you should, there's processing stickers. I put some coding train stickers out there. I know people like stickers, so that's only why I'm mentioning them. Not because you need to take a sticker. It's okay not to take a sticker. But I do have some extra ones in my backpack or something if people are looking for stickers. And I uh, look forward to hearing any feedback or, and that sort of thing. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>